Hello and welcome everybody. Apologies, I cannot see my own camera for a moment. So if you saw me staring at the screen uh, in a slightly robotic fashion, I apologize. Um, my name is uh, Carmen Talbot. I'm the project manager for Heritage Digital and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on getting started with video content. We are funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and this is the Heritage Digital Programme. Now, before I introduce you to today's trainer, Nick Street, there's a bit of introduction and background from me about the project. Heritage Digital is a consortium project of four partners and we fuse heritage and digital skill experience. Together, we create free high quality digital skills training events and resources for the UK heritage sector on the themes of communications, marketing strategy, technology and digital rights. And we welcome staff, volunteers, trustees and freelancers associated with heritage organisations to engage with our programme. Now, the project is led by the Heritage Alliance and we are a charity and we promote the role of the independent heritage sector. We're a membership body of over 150 heritage organisations. And if you are interested in joining or supporting our work, please do get in touch. The main work of the Alliance is to influence the government on behalf of the independent heritage movement and facilitate connections between organisations both within and outside of the sector. We also run capacity building programmes like this one and our other National Lottery Heritage Fund supported COVID-19 response programme, Rebuilding Heritage. Now a little bit about our project partners. Charity Digital are our digital technology specialist partner. They are hosts of the project website and mailing list and event managers of our webinars and virtual events. And they know how to do a webinar much better than myself. Um, it's their expertise that makes everything run so smoothly. Naomi Corn Associates are our digital rights specialist partner, delivering content on rights management, data protection, and how the heritage sector needs to consider these necessities in the increasingly digital world. Finally, today's webinar leads are our digital communications and marketing specialist partner, Media Trust. Media Trust work in partnership with the media and creative industries to give charities, underrepresented communities and young people a strong voice through training and access to resources um, and matching with communications and digital expert volunteers. Uh, a small sample of what they've created so far for the Heritage Digital Programme includes a webinar and guide on engaging audiences online, a session on how to create cut through digital content and an in-depth workshop on how to get started with digital fundraising. Media Trust trainer for today's session is filmmaker and consultant Nick Street and I will tell you a little bit more about Nick in a moment but before I ask Nick to join me there are a couple of housekeeping points. The presentation element today will be around an hour long. Um, we have then allowed for around half an hour of audience questions, which will take the finish time to 11.30. If you have a question for Nick, please write it in the box marked Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use the general chat box to introduce yourself, um, speak to others and flag any technical issues that you might experience. The recording of this session and the presentation slides will be made publicly available after the event and emailed directly to everyone on the Heritage Digital mailing list. We aim to get this done within about two weeks. We're using an AI captioning service for the event today. Um, for those on Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, you should see an option to turn on closed captions. It may say CC. Uh, we've noticed that these AI captions are getting increasingly better. Finally, we hope that you enjoy today's webinar and we'll give us feedback via the form that will pop up as you leave the event at the end. Now, I'm delighted to introduce your speaker for today's session, Nick Street. A, he's a filmmaker and consultant who works extensively with the heritage sector. Nick, will you join me on the screen? Can everyone see me and hear me there? Brilliant. Yeah. Yes, got to you. Um, I'm going to do a little spiel about you, uh, and then I'm going to I'm going to leave the screen, if I may. Um, so Nick is a multidisciplinary filmmaker with over ten years' experience, specialising in digital and audiovisual content for museums, heritage, and academic organisations. Through his production company Street Films, he has produced and directed numerous films from concept to delivery for major temporary, permanent, and international touring exhibitions, alongside various digital platforms. 
Now I have a, a, an excellent roll call of some of your clients, but uh, to, to highlight a few, Nick has worked for the National History Museum, Royal Parks, Canal and River Trust, the Wordsworth Trust and the Royal Society. And he's been featured by the Royal Academy, Tate, BBC and, and Channel 4 to, to name a few. Welcome, Nick. Thank you very much, Carmen. Thanks for having me. It's a real privilege to run the session. Great, right. I know you've got loads to get through because I've seen your slides. Um, so I am going to leave the screen, but I will I will watch the Q&A and I will be, be back at the end. Great. Thanks so much, Carmen. Um, yeah, we have got quite a lot to try uh, to get through. I mean, it's a huge topic and each of you as individuals and organisations will be coming at different stages in terms of what you're doing or hoping to do with video and different challenges. So we're going to try and cover as broad a sort of selection of um, introductory tips and guidance and thoughts and hopefully some inspiration too during the session um, and then of course there's a chance at the end for Q&A for anything more specific or particular. Um, so yeah thanks for the introduction Carmen. Um, so yes Street Films we um, work both across audiovisual installations for exhibitions um, which involves obviously collaborating with you know curators and designers um, and conservators and, and academics on those exhibitions and we also work across digital content as well um, specifically designed for, for websites or for, for social media for YouTube as well. So we work across both of those. Um, my background is as a, as a cinematographer and director producer um, and street films we have a small group of associates specialising in sort of animation and sound design so that we can collaborate to, to bring um, stories and, and exhibitions um, to life. Um, okay, um, I'll give you a quick little flavour of some of our work in our one minute little showreel and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk through um, what we're going to try and cover in the session. Okay, um, so here's what we're going to try to get through today. So we're going to look at some examples of what people are doing in terms of video content um, across the sector. And whilst each of these have you know, merits in their own right, what I'm really looking to do is extract from those examples what the kind of underlying approach and formats are to give you a kind of idea or perhaps even a template for how you might approach similar things. Um, and then we're going to look at sort of what video can really offer, uh, particularly to, to heritage. Um, then we're going to sort of go through the production process. So think a bit about pre-production, uh, which is really fundamentally important, no matter how ambitious or straightforward your project. So getting a kind of good plan together and thinking through what you want to achieve. Um, then we're going to look at production in the form of equipment, um, either sort of no budget using uh, you know, smartphones or things you have available to you already, um, or equipment you might consider investing in. We're going to look at some, some approaches then, techniques in terms of um, filming and production, post-production, and given limited time in the session, what I'll focus on are, are the sort of tools that are available um, at different budgets and with different needs, so you can consider what might be best for you. Um, we're going to talk a bit about platforms in terms of the, what they allow, for, um, different platforms allow for video content, and then we'll finish with a little bit about working with suppliers where um, uh, there's a sort of collaboration potentially to be had between yourselves in-house and external creative suppliers. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, uh, I've got a poll for you guys, um, in fact I think it's two polls here at the start. Um, it's just really helpful for me to know 
um, where you guys are coming from in terms of what your primary motivations are. There's lots of reasons to be creating video content. So we've got four questions. We've got um, to increase in-person visitor numbers, so sort of draw people actually to your, to your site. Um, to uh, increase engagement online itself, um, to educate or to create sort of learning resources for uh, people, um, or indeed to support uh, sort of funding applications and donations as well. So I can see that that is uh, totaling up now. Wow, it's great to see this going up. Okay, um, we'll give it another 10, 15 seconds. Most people have voted now. Okay, so um, we've got uh, increase in person visitor numbers at 34%. Uh, increase uh, engagement online um, is 52%, so that's by far the highest. Um, creating online learning resources at 31%, and just 4% of you primarily looking to do this to support funding applications. So that's great. Um, and I think, you know, video is such a fantastic tool uh, to be engaging people online. So that's really helpful for me to know as well. Um, okay, we'll go to the next um, poll here. So I guess it's just useful again for me to know what kind of experience you guys uh, have already in terms of creating video content. So do you have no experience, a little bit of experience or, or lots of experience? Um, okay. Great. Um, so that's most people voted now. So we've got 54% of you with no experience, um, 43 with a little experience and a few of you, eight of you with lots of experience. Okay, great. Well, I really hope that we can cover something that'd be useful for, for all of you, but that's, that's really helpful for me to know. So moving on, get back to here. Right, so some of these examples, and like I said, what I'm really keen um, to do is just to kind of touch on the approach and the sort of format rather than just the specific merits, merits of each example. And also because obviously watching lots of videos is gonna take time, we're gonna dip into these and then just quickly pause and reflect um, when these slides are shared um, after the session as a resource. Um, all these videos will be included as a link so you can watch them in more detail or other things from those organizations um, if you wish. Okay, so here is the first. there so it's extremely short the actual visual content itself is about 20 seconds long and what's interesting about this is that there's no real kind of didactic content there's no voiceover no captions it's purely using the video content as a sort of visual tool to bring um the the sort of context the gardens and also some glimpses of the collection to life um one benefit of this is that it's a very very flexible asset you can then repurpose this with a different context in terms of the caption that you can see to the side on, you know, in this case, uh, Instagram. Um, and it's just a visual tool that you can use and, um, and contextualize and package differently depending on what you need to do. So video doesn't have to be interviews, lots of editing, lots of complex content. It can just be a visual way to draw you in and also very short, sort of 20 seconds in this case. Um, oops, cut to this next one here. Um, So this is obviously to, to promote um, uh, an exhibition um, at Sir John Soane's Museum. And again, there's very little sort of didactic content. It's very much glimpses. And interestingly, rather than focusing on the, the completed exhibition and essentially giving it away, it focuses on um, you know, the, the installation of the exhibition um, and just glimpses that don't, uh, yeah, don't show you too much and don't actually reveal the whole thing, but tease and give you a sense of what's to come. And I think also, you know, in general, one thing that audiences are so fascinated with 
with um, heritage organizations and institutions is that sense of behind the scenes. The, the, the privilege that many of you have is in being able to work with closely and often handle objects or artworks um, that other people would never get a chance to interact with in that way. So getting that sense of the kind of behind the scenes operation um, and, and the sort of tactile interaction um, with objects and artworks um, and places is something which is of real fascination. So I think that's just something there which you guys have as a real uh, unique opportunity um, working in your sector is to kind of lift the lid and reveal what's happening behind the scenes. So it's not always about the finished article, the process and the journey is actually of a lot of interest as well. Um, another example here, very briefly, I probably won't play the whole of this, it's a bit longer. So again, here it's slightly different, isn't it? It's it's obviously there's an implicit, um, you know, sort of uh, offer here in terms of showing off the the collection and the spaces in the museum itself, but also some more specific didactic content as well in terms of um, you know changes that have been made, um, you know, with reopening with uh, you know sort of COVID safe practices in mind. So, but again, rather than going for interview or voiceover, um, the format here is a visual montage and then text captions. Um, so again, it's quite an achievable approach if you kind of think purely in terms of visual sequences and adding things in text rather than having to consider how to script something to have it voiced over to have interviews. So it's a really achievable format to get across um, some more specific content within the video itself, rather than just relying on the caption to do that part of it. Um, okay, the next example here. This is an example really of, of, of kind of trying to take an exhibition online. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll show you a little bit of this and we'll talk about it. Experimental self-driving vehicles are taking to our streets, skies and seas, powered by artificial intelligence. They might transport you around cities, grow your food or deliver packages to your doorstep. They could reveal hidden glimpses of the world around you and even save lives. They are designed to outperform humans at specialized tasks. Okay, so I'm going to pause there. It's, uh, it's worth watching this one in full, actually, when you have the link. It's really interesting. And what's interesting about the format is that it actually combines footage of the physical exhibition and glimpses of that space and how it's been arranged in terms of the objects with a sort of, you know, uh, archive um, or stock footage um, to give you, to sort of use the best of both. Some of this footage was taken from audiovisual um, exhibits within the exhibition itself but has brought them together in sort of one uh, one video here um, and then um, voiced over uh, in a scripted way. Again, which, um, you know, we could have chosen here to have, have had interviewees done it that way, but this um, the sort of use of kind of scripted narration um, can be quite good where you really want a kind of focused, structured um, piece like that. So that's another way you can kind of maybe combine a sort of physical exhibition and um, digital to create something like an, an online visit in a sense. Um, okay, another example here. So this is fantastic. This again is 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 really playing to the strengths of um, that kind of sense of behind the scenes and um, what is happening specifically you know, during lockdown, for example. But also again that glimpse behind um, the operation and and, to, and 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 to see behind the what are currently still closed doors um, of many institutions. Hi, I'm Claire and I'm here at Titchener Museum of Art and Craft for Virtual Museum Club. Unfortunately the museum is temporarily closed to public but that means I get the place to myself and I can show you some of the objects from the permanent collection here at the museum. So I'm just going to pause there. And this, you know, this is fantastic. It's a real kind of authenticity uh, to the content. It's really direct. It's it's informal in the best possible way. Um, and it's also very, very achievable format. You know, what um, uh, Claire's done here is got a, you know, a phone potentially or a camera on a tripod, locked off, hit record, 
and then it's just delivering the content. And you'll see if you watch the full thing um, that then it's just been cut together really simply, but in a really kind of direct and authentic way, um, which is fantastic. And here's another quick example, just with a diff slightly different approach. And today's virtual archive five, I'm talking about a very special object, and that is this bathtub. So uh, it's the only uh, actual museum object that's left on the SS Great Britain. Everything else is a reconstruction. Um, this is one of the original bathtubs that actually uh, was on the ship when she came back in 1970. So I'm going to pause there. And today's pause, virtual archive. Uh, pause there. The difference here, obviously, is that rather than having a locked off camera, which means that you can't pan to or move to and have you know the object and and the person talking here there's clearly you know had to be a collaboration between potentially two members of staff in order to be able to kind of move the camera around and be more dynamic um when you're actually delivering it which is you know again worth considering if you're in a situation where you can do that you can do a lot more in terms of flexibility where with somebody else holding the camera rather than just having it locked off so that's just a thought there um I'll just touch on this one very briefly. This is a, a sort of professionally made behind After the scenes film. After looking at thousands of drawings over the course of years, this is the first Michelangelo that I've conserved. There are never two drawings that have aged the same way. Most old master drawings are treated very conservatively. Because this is in such bad condition, it was decided that it was worthwhile to undertake treatment. So I'm going to pause there again. So again, you know, I think for people often working in, in a, an institution where they get to handle a, a Michelangelo and that's part of their job, it's easy to forget how, again, unique an opportunity that is. And for people coming to an exhibition where they see a painting, a drawing, an object in the gallery, obviously at distance and certainly not able to handle it, um, that just seems like an impossible thing. But again, to be able to give a glimpse of the kind of uh, the sort of physicality and tactile interaction you can have with these um, objects uh, and pieces and the work that goes into their care, the conservation um, um, and getting them ready to be shared and finding out about their sort of provenance and stories um, is fascinating. So again, I really encourage you to sort of think about those opportunities you might have um, to share the work you're doing behind the scenes. Um, there's one other thing here. I'll just give you a quick glimpse of this one. Buildings like York Minster are really stories in stone. They're the product of centuries of repair and replacement. And as archaeologists, we want to unpick that story and tell that story. York Minster really is out there on its own. And to go into the building and be surrounded by the greatest collection of medieval glass in Britain is... An this is the first time that a project of this scale has been attempted with researchers working alongside conservators. So the partnership really between the university and the workshop has been a, a new benchmark for taking projects of this kind forward. Okay, the reason to show you this and the reason to jump forward there is about structure, really. It would have been tempting and actually, you know, uh, it could often have been done to jump straight into the partnership um, and the process, which is what this film is ultimately about, about sort of, a, you know, uh, how the partnership has, has allowed this work and these investigations and conservation work to take place. But by drawing you in on a kind of sort of um, a kind of more thematic level and with a slower start, this is actually presented and comes across much, much more like a kind of piece of standalone content, much more like a documentary. And therefore, it still does the work it needs to do in terms of celebrating and promoting the project and what they've been able to achieve but without it starting with the kind of the cell and drawing you into kind of um, what makes the project interesting. So I'd think about that in terms of, of structure sometimes and not going straight for the cell and thinking about what really we can, what you, what you can focus on to draw people into the story and, and why it's interesting, why it's important. Um, so it's that. Um, it's a few examples here of how to films. These are fantastically popular across a whole range of platforms. Um, and again, a couple of informal examples and a couple of sort of more professional examples. But this is something, again, which is a really achievable way to start doing video content um, and hugely popular, actually, across different platforms. It's a gardener at Chiswick House. And today we're fruit pruning. Now, you can fruit prune your fruit trees, not stone fruit, um, but apples and pears, any time from now till March. Um, I'm starting now because I've got 280 
uh, different trees here in the garden to get through. Okay, which sounds like a bit of a challenge. Again, you know, really straightforward in terms of format, camera on a tripod, very sort of natural, unscripted delivery. Um, he goes on then to kind of actually talk through how to do the pruning, as well as obviously celebrating, you know, the offer that they have there and, and the, the gardens um, at Chiswick House as well. Um, another example here. Um, actually, the, notice on this one where the camera is placed. This is a very good way uh, in terms of craft um, to actually film them rather than having the camera down facing forwards. Um, where you get to see you know, yourself as well, is having the camera mounted on a tripod higher and looking down onto the table so you get a better sense of um, actually uh, following the process. Do a blue peeper peter moment. Here's one I cut earlier. Here's one I cut earlier. Here's one I cut earlier. So when you've cut 16, then just cut away the last bit. You don't need those. And you might not need to use all of these. So you see how you get a much clearer view of the actual process like this. And this is a kind of a, a sort of longer form video. And in terms of setting it up, um, again, the reason I've kept the, the captions in on the right hand side is that you can see how the description of what you put in here can do a lot of work in terms of contextualizing it, uh, introducing who's involved, uh, who's um, you know doing the process, and then it frees up the video content itself to be much more naturalistic and just follow the process um, rather than have to set it up too much in the video. Um, another quick example. This is using um, locked off camera, cutting out the gaps where the hand was coming in to, to do things and then just using text captions this time. Okay, and um, I'm just gonna jump forward now to here. One thing that this um, uh, really lends itself to is a series. I think where you find a format or approach um, that works for you, having a kind of a, an established and developed template which you can roll out across uh, different stories, different bits of content, but kind of present them as a collection is a really, really good way to, to increase and sort of retain um, digital engagement. So if you look here, there are a few examples of um, Tate English Heritage and Science Museums, um, sort of how-to videos. The reason to show these is because what they've done really fantastically is just consistently package them. So you've got the same kind of thumbnail, you've got the same sort of um, look and feel and packaging, which allow the actual video content themselves often varies quite a lot, but they present as a series and that's something which will keep people coming back and that you can add to and build as a, as a collection of content. Um, really quickly, this is an example of, of a kind of campaign, again, with a kind of a format in mind, um, which can then be rolled out over a series of different specific ideas. <laughs> Okay, incredibly short, 12 seconds. Um, another one, quickly. Okay, so you can see how once the work was done in terms of the concept, the, the sort of graphics and text at the start and at the end, the only thing that's really changed between those two videos, and there's a whole series of these, is the particular clip to give a sense of different canals, different people, different places. And then you've sort of built a broader campaign um, that's sort of more impactful and more varied and interesting than just having one film. Um, so again, I'd encourage you to think uh, in that kind of way, if you come up with a simple format, can there be 10 different shots and therefore quite easily 10 different bits of content that can support a particular story or exhibition or campaign um, that you have. Okay, lastly, just a quick thought that if you have your, you know, your footage uh, that you might have used for a particular film, it can also be used just as a sort of design asset potentially on your website. So for example, here, um, Shire Hall, um, which is a, a sort of a historic courthouse in Dorset, have used exhibition film and then taken those clips without the sound purely to have as a kind of dynamic background um, on their website, which gives a bit of a glimpse of the spaces um, without giving too much away, I should note, um, but is a nice way to kind of bring a website to life. Um, there's another example here briefly from 
um, the Wordsworth Trust, Wordsworth in Grasmere and Cumbria. So again, just glimpses that give you a sense of the people, the place, and bring the kind of website to life and just make use of an existing video asset in a different context, um, which makes a connection between the film that's in the gallery um, and the website, but also helps bring that to life. Um, okay. Um, so um, why video? I think particularly for uh, the heritage sector, there's an, a, a really strong, unique case um, for the, the opportunity you have, particularly in-house, to bring your places, buildings, objects, collections, and your people, staff and volunteers um, to life. And videos are just a fantastic tool for that. Um, storytelling, um, both in terms of literally, your, you know, in the case of those um, uh, videos uh, behind the scenes of you as staff, volunteers, freelancers, telling those stories directly, but also video is that, you know, well-established, fantastic format for kind of uh, a kind of a narrative. Um, and as we said, increasing engagement, um, increasing the organization's profile as well, um, and, and hopefully increasing um, sort of footfall in due course when things are able to, to reopen. I think there's a few particular challenges that it's worth keeping in mind, and this will help you decide often about whether a video needs to be made. It's not always the right format, um, and it is a commitment as well. So, um, you know, it's worth thinking about this. So one thing is um, video is a linear format. And what obviously like, you, know, you click play and you have to watch through. It's not like something like a series of pictures um, and uh, captions where you can tap through back and forth and linger as long as you like on one or skip through others. So that comes with a price in terms of drop off. If your structure doesn't lend itself to grabbing people's attention or drawing people in, people will drop off. So every 10, 20, 30 seconds um, with digital video content, you lose viewers. So that kind of presents the question, do I kind of get everything in at the start or what's the best way to kind of structure things? But it's keeping that linear format in mind, it's less flexible. Um, there's the perceived technical barriers, but I hope we can touch on getting over some of those uh, today. And then, like I said, there's time. It is a big commitment to make video content, um, especially the more complex you get. And you're also then asking time of people to watch. So some alternatives, not that I'm trying to suggest we don't make video content, but some alternatives are things like a series of photographs or still images and captions. So something like Instagram stories that many of you might be aware of where you can kind of tap through yourself and present stills or little clips with, with captions as well. Or things like graphics where you can combine photographs with text just as in individual still images. Um, I put Spark Post there, which is a fantastic app that you can use to create things like that. So those are alternatives where maybe video isn't the right format, but let's uh, continue. So some thoughts here with pre-production. So before you actually get out your camera or start filming. Um, so there's kind of key things to consider. So the what, what is your kind of overall message? Like what are you really trying to achieve with the video? And then specifically, what key bits of information do you need to get into the video? And what's the most relevant? What's the most interesting? What's going to really draw people in? And then the second point is what needs to go in the video itself and what perhaps could reside in the caption or in the context for the film. If it's in a physical exhibition, that could be the, the panel. It could be the other um, is it exhibits around it. If it's on a website, it could be the article that it's embedded within. So not everything has to go into the video. Um, you can complement it with other things too. And that lightens the, the, the burden on that piece of video content as well. Then who? So who might be in the film in terms of contributors? So staff, volunteers, visitors, um, experts, and who the audience is as well. You might be aiming a bit of content at a very general audience, which means you might need to set up more in terms of context. Who are you? What are, what are you about as an organization? Or you might have a very specific audience in mind for a piece of content. Now, when I said, what do they know and what do they need to know? What I mean is, what might they already know before they hit play? Now, if your video is on Instagram, clearly on your channel, with a caption that explains who you are and what the video is a part of in terms of perhaps a project or campaign, you don't necessarily have to set that up again within the video. You could perhaps assume at least some of that context would have presented that information, which again, lightens the load on the video. So don't feel you always have to introduce your organization and the full context within each piece of content. Uh, some thoughts about where, so locations in terms of where are you actually going to film, um, a vlog or an interview, your visual shots, or record a voiceover. 
Um, and then where's it going to go? What platforms is this specifically intended for? Um, and then why? So what is your actual motivation? What are your aims for the piece of content? Do you have a call to action? Or do you have something like in particular that you hope people would do after watching it? Um, okay, um, a few other thoughts. Uh, script, which um, I use loosely because I don't mean um, necessarily a verbatim script, what you will say word for word. In terms of script, I mean really establishing the structure, the beginning, middle, end, and the sort of journey of your piece of content. Um, thinking both in terms of what you're going to get across in terms of information or what you're going to say and what you're going to show as well. Um, and I would generally encourage you not to have a verbatim script because uh, it's difficult to deliver those things naturally. I mean, you know, TV presenters uh, have a particular job for a reason, they're often able to do that, but most people uh, aren't able to deliver a verbatim script, particularly naturally. So I would have a sense of the structure, the points you want to cover, but then explore that in the form of a more natural delivery or in the form of an interview where you might have briefed the person, they might know what they're going to cover and what they're going to say, but it allows them a chance to say it naturally in their own words. Um, so uh, thinking about the visuals, uh, making a list of shots, specifically what you're actually gonna try and film. Um, speaking to stakeholders, even if it's just your colleagues, a sense of what you're actually gonna try and achieve. Does, does this on paper meet the objectives? Is there anything else you'd add or cut? And then revisit after you filmed and say, oh, we didn't get this, or can we, can we tweak this? And keep people engaged. And it means that when you've put your edit uh, together, you're gonna have less to change because you're gonna have people on board already. Um, and just in terms of time, um, video content, even relatively straightforward video content can take time to do. And so it's just keeping that, um, keeping things simple where you can and keeping time available where you need to do things more in a more complex way. Okay, another poll. Um, so what equipment do you plan to use uh, for filming video content? Um, so I've got uh, just my smartphone, perhaps colleague's smartphone, um, smartphone and perhaps considering accessories to make um, uh, that's sort of most of those tools or filming equipment in terms of potentially investing in a particular camera or other equipment. Okay, so this is very interesting. Um, most people voted. So a real mix actually. Um, so we have at the moment, yeah, so about 30% um, of people, 29% of people saying just my smartphone. Um, the most people, 46 have said smartphone and accessories. And then about 26% of you have said filming equipment. So we're, we're gonna cover each of those and a bit of the benefits and shortcomings. Um, but yes, smartphone and accessories, it's one that one. Um, okay, so in terms of equipment, let me just get rid of that poll. Um, in terms of smartphones, there are loads of obvious benefits. So they're generally always with us now. Um, they are genuinely easy to use. Um, and the cameras now, in, you know, and, and most relatively new smartphones are, are really impressive. There's no sort of obvious shortcomings there, but there's a few things to keep in mind. So one is the limited battery. If you run out of battery on your phone, you can't put a new one in. Uh, during the course of the day, that's it. You're gonna have to charge it up again. And the storage is generally, some smartphones you can put a new little card in, but most smartphones, that storage is integrated. So if you run out of space, then you can't put a new card in. There's no usable zoom um, on most smartphones. And people might be saying, well, hold on a minute, I can pinch on my screen to zoom in, but actually that's just cropping in to the image. You're not actually zooming in using glass like you would on a, on a proper camera. Um, you're just reducing the quality of what you're recording. So I would say don't use your Zoom. Um, you, many of you will know the microphones and sound quality is quite limited uh, on smartphones. The little microphones aren't really uh, particularly well attuned to picking out voices, particularly within a busy environment. Um, you've got limited control over the image, uh, which can be a benefit in terms of ease of use, but also a limitation. And smartphones also struggle with uh, lower light or kind of more challenging light conditions where you've got some extremely bright areas or darker areas. So a few thoughts there. So how can you get around some of those? Well, a lot of those shortcomings you can get around uh, with accessories. So we'll go through a few of these. So on the left here, we've got some of the microphone attachments you can get. One thing, uh, by the way, that I will add to these slides uh, when they're sent as a resource is some specific links and also names of kind of recommended brands because um, there's a huge amount of different companies making these things. But in terms of the actual use of them, 
Top left, we've got um, these little uh, directional microphones that can clip onto the top of smartphones. That mean the microphone is going to record predominantly uh, the direction that you're filming in. So if you're filming somebody talking, you'll get much less of any noise from sort of traffic or other people in the background and a better um, sound from the person you're interviewing. But bottom left, these lapel microphones, um, and by the way, when you buy them, they often only come with a sort of one meter cable. So you might want to get an extension too, for sort of two or three meters. But these can then go under a shirt or t-shirt or jumper and clip on. And then you've got the microphone really, really close and you'll get a much, much better sound out of that just because the microphone's much closer to the voice than that surrounding environment. So that's a really, really good investment. And one of those starts from as little as sort of 15, 20 pounds. And that's the single probably most important accessory you could consider for smartphones to take up the quality. In the middle here, we've got different lenses. You can get lens attachments that clip on um, that can give you a wider angle or a closer kind of telephoto angle. Um, and also, if you do have a, a new smartphone that's got multiple lenses, do take advantage of that because some of the very new ones have a wide angle lens built in that you can see more context and even a telephoto or what's often called a portrait lens built in, which will give a more flattering image of people and more focused image on people. Um, you can consider tripods, um, which uh, again, if you're filming yourself, um, like some of those examples are pretty crucial. You don't wanna be holding your phone out like this where you're trying to do something or show something. Um, they also allow you to film time lapses because if a camera's static and you use the time lapse function on a camera, then the image will overall be still and it will just be the clouds or the people or things moving in the middle of the frame. And then in the bottom, we've got these gimbals, uh, which essentially balance your phone as you move around. These were incredibly expensive until relatively recently, but actually are increasingly worth considering, especially if you want some more dynamic shots moving through landscape or spaces or buildings um, that you're working in. Um, if you are in, filming in interiors, it might be worth considering some LED lighting. The technology again has come on leaps and bounds, is much more affordable, uh, much brighter for the money than it used to be, um, and can make a huge difference when you're filming interviews or objects inside. And then finally, you might wanna consider if you're filming objects in your collection, um, some simple studio tools, like a kind of background role, or even one of these mini um, kind of pop-up studios that allow you to put objects in and light them uh, through these kind of transparent white sides and get a much kind of uh, nicer image out of them. So there's some thoughts there. So why would you consider a, a proper camera when smartphones are so good and can be accessorized? Well, there's a sort of middle ground. It's not smartphones or you know big professional cameras. These are what are often called hybrid cameras or mirrorless cameras or a middle ground where because of the technology, they have much bigger sensors inside them and can utilize proper lenses. They essentially gather a huge amount more light and you often get a much cleaner image. So particularly if you're filming inside, uh, either with collections or inside a historic building, for example, um, and you're struggling to get clean or good images out of your phone, this is where it might be really worth considering an investment. Um, you also get replaceable batteries, so you can have a few batteries that you can keep charged up. You can replace storage in case you run out of, um, of space. Um, and actually, uh, secondhand, um, you can get some incredible deals on these, on these cameras. So these are some recommended kind of ranges, and there's the latest version, and they're not, you know, they're, they're not cheap at all. But if you're willing to consider a couple of versions previous in a series, you can get some really, really good deals, and these are still going to be very, very good. Uh, particularly in those more challenging situations in terms of light. Um, okay. Um, I, and, and finally, uh, on equipment, drones. So again, this would have been unthinkable to even recommend um, a few years ago, and even actually a few months ago, because what has changed recently is the civil aviation authorities' uh, laws around the use of small drones. Um, it's no longer li uh, limited to, uh, in terms of professional use to people who have a license or a permission from the Civil Aviation Authority. It's, it's now considered on the basis of risk. So it's too complex to go into in detail now, but there's a link here. Uh, but for those of you in rural environments um, or with a big site where you've got a lot of open space around, it's genuinely worth considering, both in terms of it now being essentially legal if you do it in the appropriate way for you to do yourselves, 
um, but also relatively affordable. So, you know, these small drones, these DJI drones are 240 grams that sit on the palm of your hand and they're about 360 pounds. And again, within months, there'll be a newer version and these will be cheaper still and on the second hand market. And, you know, there's a, that's a huge potential there um, in comparison to perhaps paying a drone company to come in and film footage professionally. Uh, to give you that flexibility um, and perhaps the sort of following the seasons and opportunities when they present themselves. So I would consider that too. Um, okay, some tips in terms of filming, um, particularly here with sort of smartphones and accessories in mind. Um, airplane mode um, to save your battery, to stop people calling you uh, or messaging you while you're filming content or interviews. Um, generally speaking, if you're making something which is gonna have a life on YouTube, uh, or in a kind of longer film, then filming on your side on, uh, with your phone on its side like this is the way to go uh, to avoid having kind of black bars down the side of the image, which you might sometimes see perhaps on the news if somebody's captured some content, you know, first on the scene, uh, a disaster or something. Um, so, uh, but actually with Instagram in mind, you'll notice both for Instagram stories and indeed some of those videos that I showed you that there's an increasing convention to use video this way up. So it will depend what your intention is. Just to reiterate, um, not to use the digital zoom. So don't pinch in, rely on your lenses if you have them or rely on your feet and just get closer to things where you can. And then this little kind of take five series of tips. So one is taking your time. Uh, I know a lot of people new to video don't appreciate how long you need to film for to have usable clips and flexibility in your edit. So don't just sort of grab two, three seconds and then get something else. Try to film for at least sort of 10, 15 seconds for each clip. And that way you'll have a choice in your edit over the steadiest moment, the moment where something interesting happens, perhaps the sun comes out um, and uh, you'll have much more flexibility when you're editing. Then in terms of keeping things steady, people will often hit record on their smartphone and hold it out like this. And, you know, I'm exaggerating here, but these tiny little movements which we make with our hands can render footage pretty much unusable or certainly make it obvious that it's sort of uh, amateur footage. So what you can do is you can kind of create a, a, a sort of platform with your elbows like this and hold your phone steady so you can still see it and then essentially use your hips or in this case, a swivel chair to get much, much steadier shots um, and make your movement motivated. So I've said, take it slow. Don't sort of hit record and then just look around like you might when you walk into a room or to a place. Think in terms of specific clips. So think, you know, you want to get perhaps a pan around the room or you want to get a tilt up to the ceiling, but do them separately and do them slowly and make it clear what that movement is. Um, I then said, take it in. So vary your angles. Don't just walk in and film things from eye height. You know, filming is an opportunity to show things in a different way. So look straight up at the ceiling, get down really low and film across um, the floor and showing the room. Um, and think in terms of sequences. So multiple shots of the same thing, some from wide, some close, to give you variety and an opportunity to cut together an interesting sequence. Um, and then I've just said multiple takes. So when you are filming yourself uh, doing a, a piece to camera or filming an interview, you know, you can just do things again. So don't feel like, you know, you have to kind of keep what you get first time. You can experiment, you can try things more than once and then you've got flexibility. Okay, a few thoughts on creative approaches, particularly with specific challenges in mind of different environments. So here's a thought, some thoughts on kind of landscape and gardens. Um, so it's really in landscape about getting a, a contrast between wide shots and telephoto shots, if you can, again, depending on the equipment you're using. But with wide angle shots, either on your wide lens, on your smartphone or on a camera, getting foreground detail in makes a much more dynamic shot. So in this top left here, you've got sort of autumn leaves right in the foreground and then a sense of the landscape going off behind. That tree is only about sort of six, seven meters away, but it's a very wide lens. It gives you a dynamic view. And then at the bottom three here, this is what a telephoto lens does. So sharpness docks in Gloucestershire, bottom left, is actually about a kilometer away from where this is taken. But the compression that a telephoto lens allows brings things that are far away together with your foreground. It gives you a much more dynamic view. So again, the horse is against um, uh, Chepstow and these hills here on the bottom right in the Lake District. Each of those hills is very, very far apart, but the telephoto lens compresses things and gives you this view. 
Um, thoughts about light, um, just avoid midday if you can. Getting up early, staying out late is the way to get kind of more dynamic light. And using backlight as well, that top right example, filming through uh, a plant, you might often think that filming the sun on something is the way to get a really dynamic shot, but often filming through leaves uh, from behind trees and getting the light kind of filtering through is a much more dynamic way to, to do it. Um, and in terms of planning, the one thing I'll just say is to use this tool called SunCalc. If it's somewhere you've not been before, it's a free app and it basically shows you any date, any place, any pin across the whole world where the sun will be at what time of day. So you can plan your shots and plan uh, the best light. Uh, inside, um, I would say one thing is about perhaps teasing and not giving everything away. You don't have to give away the whole of your, uh, the interior of your historic building. Uh, you can just give glimpses uh, using abstract shots. Maybe it's just the light across the floor um, or almost kind of certain things in silhouette or using reflections and details rather than just wide shots of the whole room. Um, and also the limitations. So perhaps you're inside um, a historic church um, and the light comes in through the stained glass windows, but the rest of it sort of remains quite dark. Well, maybe then just getting the shots of those, um, the light filtering through across the floor and not trying to fight the light where you haven't got enough to show the rest of the building. Or this is one of those examples where that professional camera might be worth considering borrowing or secondhand to allow more light gathering if you're filming in those lower light internal situations. Um, in terms of collections and objects, um, I think it's, just, it's about contrast between the scale, the breadth of what you have on offer um, and details um, if where you can. Um, and also I, I would really uh, encourage you where it's appropriate and possible to feature your, yourselves handling, interacting with these objects. Again, that's a unique thing which you guys can do, which a visitor won't get that chance to do. So handling objects, uh, a sense of that interaction with them, either uh, in, uh, behind the scenes um, or otherwise, is a really powerful thing to feature in your, in your videos. Uh, and then lastly, here's some thoughts about featuring images, whether those be archive images um, or still photographs or documents or books. Um, and some thoughts about how you can bring those to life. So a lot of the editing apps we're going to touch on have this uh, what's called pan and scan or sometimes Ken Burns effect that allows the camera to sort of move across images or to slowly zoom into images to bring them to life. That's really helpful. Um, you can also layer images. So you, rather than having just a shot of a uh, the, the archive image itself, you can layer them over other video shots and create more dynamic compositions. Um, or indeed, where possible, you can film the physical original itself if it's something in your collection. So rather than having a photograph of it, which is just then fairly static and flat, actually having film footage and giving it that sense of being a physical object as well as um, the, the sort of text or image itself. OK, um, moving on to editing. Um, give me a sense, please, of yeah, what device you plan to use. Do you plan to use your laptop or desktop? Um, perhaps your smartphone or perhaps a bit of both? This would be really helpful. Okay, that's interesting. Great, okay. So actually the overwhelming majority, well, the majority certainly are saying uh, that you'd use your laptop and desktop. So about 65% of you there. Um, just a few of you, 3% are saying smartphone, and some of you are saying both. Okay, that's really interesting, and that's very helpful. Um, okay, and then in terms of uh, the tool then, um, oops, let me just go back, sorry. Um, would you consider paying for a fully featured uh, editing application? So the, the opportunities are, no, I'd only consider something completely free. Uh, yes, but ideally something cheap, um, or yes, the best tool for the job, whatever the, whatever the cost. Um, well, not necessarily whatever the cost, but you know what I mean. Um, okay, again, this is interesting. Um, I'll just wait till most of you have voted. Okay, so 90% of you have voted now. So uh, we've got 25% saying, no, I'd only consider something completely free. Um, we've got 64% of you saying, yes, but ideally something cheap. Um, and then 11% uh, saying, yes, the best tool for the job. Okay, that's uh, really helpful as well. So I've got a few solutions here with all of those in mind. Um, 
Now, uh, these um, are sort of proper video editors, um, which I want to touch on. Then there's a few other more simple tools, which I think it might be worth using if you want to do something more straightforward. So these are sort of the main three that I would look at considering. So there's Adobe Premiere Rush, uh, iMovie, um, I'll touch on those two first. These are the more kind of approachable tools in terms of that best balance between simplicity in their use, but also how powerful they are um, as tools. Um, so Adobe Premiere Rush is perhaps the most flexible because it's PC, uh, you know, as in Windows and Macintosh um, um, friendly, and also on mobile, uh, Apple and Android friendly as well. And what you can do is if you could start start a project perhaps on your mobile, something straightforward as the edit, you can then pick that up on your laptop um, or vice versa, because all the projects in terms of the arrangement and edit itself, but also the footage you bring into those projects automatically syncs in the cloud. And that's attached to your what's called your Adobe ID that you create when you get the app. So that's incredibly useful to be able to go in both directions, pick it up wherever you are. And also by using that Adobe ID and potentially sharing it amongst a few of your um, staff, that's an opportunity to, coll to collaborate and to be able to sign in using that same ID and to share and pick up on projects. Um, so iMovie, the, the big benefit for iMovie it, with iMovie is that it's free. So if you do have a Mac or you do have an Apple phone, it's completely free to use, which is great. Um, it's pretty much as well featured as Adobe Premiere Rush, um, but the phone and iPad version is more limited than what you can do on the desktop, and that limits that interaction back and forth. You can take something from a mobile version onto your desktop and then make something more complex and use other features, but you can't go in the other direction. So depending on, on your format, uh, on your platform rather, um, there are two options there. Um, then there's this black magic uh, DaVinci Resolve. Now this is a, essentially a professional uh, editing suite, which is free um, and it's incredibly powerful. Um, and that, sorry, there's, there are two versions, a free version and a paid for version, but the free version is, is really fully featured. It's extremely powerful, uh, but there's just a very steep learning curve really. It's much more uh, detailed, much more settings you have to take care of yourself rather than things happening under the bonnet like uh, you can expect from Adobe Premiere Rush and iMovie. So I'd say for those of you who are quite confident, this is an amazing uh, option or something to consider in due course as your ambition for your video content perhaps increases. Um, then there's some other tools here. Um, again, there are sort of free versions of these and paid for options depending on what you need. So it's quite a nice one called Lumen5. Um, which uh, is a sort of online app. So you access it through your browser and there are specific creators for different platforms and social media platforms. And you essentially take a template and upload your own content, put your own captions in and make it your own. It's extremely straightforward, but the free version essentially is low resolution and with their watermark on it. So it's not kind of clean content and you need to, be, to subscribe to get higher quality formats and to have a clean video without their logo on. Uh, so a similar thing is the case for MoSho. This takes photos and turns them into quite dynamic slideshows and you can add music as well. Um, but again, the same is the case. You've got a limited free version and an option to subscribe. And then there's Adobe Spark, which I think is an amazing tool. It's free uh, to use to an extent, but again, there's, there is a subscription for some of the, uh, the premium templates and features. But here you can combine videos and captions um, and uh, also consider Spark Post, which I haven't written down here, which is a more, more geared towards motion graphics. And again, it's very easy to use and very powerful. Okay, um, so thoughts, I'm conscious of time. I think we'll probably run five minutes over with this. Um, uh, yes, yeah, some thoughts on hosting. Now this is hosting in terms of having your video online with a view to perhaps embedding it into your website. Uh, now you can, and historically it was very common to upload your video content directly to your, your website, but um, often now um, you, you, not everyone will have uh, space to host video content because video is very big. And that then means it's just limited to being on your website. It doesn't have a life beyond um, you know, the, your, your platforms. Whereas YouTube and Vimeo, two of the most prominent uh, sort of hosting sites, mean that it has a life out there in the world and a kind of social media sense, but you can also embed that video into your website. So why would you use one or the other? Well, YouTube is much more kind of uh, 
uh, sort of you know open in terms of a social platform. Uh, people are creating incredibly successful channels in heritage and, and in other sectors where people are coming to YouTube as a destination for content. Um, and uh, so for, for getting engagement, for getting comments, for drawing people into the work you're doing, it's probably the better platform. You can also add closed captions or subtitles um, in a number of different ways. Um, there's a link here which explains different options. And those uh, crucially can be turned on and off as well. So you can have it without just a clean video or the option of those on. And that's a really useful tool. Vimeo is uh, perhaps uh, got the advantage in terms of a more professional player. So you don't have adverts um, like you do on YouTube. You probably saw some adverts popping up earlier on in those YouTube links. So there's no advert, it's a much cleaner player. So if your primary aim is to host a video with a view to embedding it in your website uh, and it looking professional as possible, Vimeo is probably the way to go from the two. But you can also do it both ways. So I have a Vimeo account for my embedded Vimeos and certain things on YouTube where I want to get the best audience possible. Um, and then just quickly, um, I'll, I won't run through this in detail, but just some thoughts about the sort of limitations of uh, different platforms. So Instagram now has a huge range of different video options. Uh, things can appear in the feed that you scroll down uh, up to a minute long. You can have your Instagram stories that are, big, that are at the top that you can tap through, where each of your sections of your story can be up to 15 seconds long. You've got Instagram TV, which is a sort of 10 minute video platform or specific for video. And then you can also broadcast live for up to 60 minutes. There's loads of options there. Facebook is almost unlimited. You can upload up to about 240 minutes. And bear in mind, um, when you scan down on a Facebook feed, uh, videos start automatically, but they'll start silent. So that's another reason why the kind of caption solution, some of those examples we looked at can be effective. So you're not relying on people opting in to the sound. Um, and Twitter um, is about, or currently is two minutes, 20 seconds limit for natively uploaded video. Again, it will auto play, but silently. So that's another thought to keep in mind. Um, some tips on assets. Um, I'm gonna sort of leave these here, but I've got tips here for getting music either free um, or kind of cheap paid for licenses um, or premium music. And by premium, uh, I mean sort of more like sort of 60, 70 pounds for a license for a piece of music. Audio Jungle, this cheap option is about five or 10 pounds. And obviously these free options um, within certain restrictions of use. So you need to look at Creative Commons um, in more detail for that. Um, that's, that's an option for using things for three. And then for stock footage, you can look at places like Unsplash and Pexels for um, free video clips that you can use within your videos. Um, there are sort of heritage specialists that it's worth considering, like Mary Evans, the National Archives, and, and Alamy. Alamy obviously are a broader um, um, a sort of stock footage uh, archive, but they do have a lot of heritage content. And then you've got commercial options as well. And without naming names, I know from experience that it's worth contacting um, these uh, stock footage providers directly and, and, and talking about your project, your organization, uh, I assume mostly being not for profit, um, because you can often twist their arm and get quite significant discounts. I certainly have been able to do that before. So I think it's worth trying with those. Um, and then just some final thoughts on working with suppliers. So there's a huge amount that can be done in-house. And for many of you, that will be all you'll ever need to do in terms of your video content. But then there's a sort of, why is there a potential case to work with suppliers? So it might be about perspective, about the best stories to tell, fresh eyes and ideas, and experience in turning those into video content. There might be a quality case in terms of the equipment or technical or experience limitations you have in-house. Um, so what a supplier can bring to that. And there might be about resources. Many of you will be incredibly busy uh, and not have time to produce more in depth or more professional video content. There's a, a collaboration to be had there. Um, and then how to do it. So a few thoughts from my experience. One is having a really clear brief in terms of what you want a piece of content to achieve, what the objectives are, but being open to the creative solutions that a supplier might bring. Uh, agreeing deliverables, by which I mean, what do you actually get sent at the end? So there's the video or videos themselves. There are potentially different versions, maybe some with and without subtitles, um, shorter edits perhaps, or trailers. Um, do you want the footage itself? 
um, and that's an agreement you have to make beforehand with the supplier uh, or any other assets as well. Then there's a sense of how that collaboration works. Do you have clear roles and responsibilities? What can you offer in house to do to, to support the production? And what are you expecting of, of that supplier in terms of the development, sort of access and logistics and the ideas themselves? Um, definitely have a schedule and build in stages for review from your end, for sign off of certain stages to be able to move forward with confidence so you know what you're going to get at the end is what you want and then in terms of the wider stakeholders and who to involve i would say it's always great for a supplier to have a single point of contact on a sort of day-to-day week-to-week level and then it's down perhaps for that point of contact to keep wider stakeholders in the loop and involved at different stages so there's other resources about this both on the formalities and process um, available on heritage digital there's a note down there about that Okay, I think we've got through it. Um, sorry, we've run a little bit over time. Um, I'm happy to stick around as long as there are questions. So i um, happy to field them as they come in. Thanks for listening. Hello again, Nick, and thank you. Thank you for all of your excellent, excellent uh, suggestions. And I think it's really important for me to say that lots of people in the chat are saying, thank you. Wow, uh, didn't think I would come to this and be able to understand it, but you've been uh, so clear and, and so okay. helpful. <laughs> now it's just kind of, it's going crazy with thanks. Um, so two things from me that have come up uh, a lot in the chat and a lot in the Q&A. Yes, these slides and the recording will be available. Um, and also the, the, the AI captioning service we use is called rev.com. That's rev.com in case you want to go and explore it. So I'll, we've got 18 questions in the q and I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just dive in. Uh, we're gonna go to, well, we're 11.30, if we go a little bit over, we'll, we'll just keep going um, for a little bit. Uh, but if you have to leave, leave, this will all be in the recording. Okay, first question is, and I think you've maybe touched on this because these have sort of come in as you've been speaking, sure. but um, it's from Olivia Wilmore and it's, Probably a silly question, but do you have any tips on finding music in the public domain? I found one or two websites, but the variety of music isn't great. You were just speaking about the free music archive, I suppose not the public yeah. domain, but licensed. That's Well, yes, but uh, most of the stuff on the free music archive falls under Creative Commons, which there's sort of complexity there that's worth understanding, but it's normally about attribution uh, and about giving essentially credit to the person who's created that piece of music. So it's it's... it's it's created as an archive with use and flexibility in mind. So the restrictions aren't prohibitive, but they're just worth understanding. Um, but that's a good option there. Um, a lot of these apps, the editing apps themselves, do have music that's supplied with them. But as you can probably imagine, that's fairly limited and not always the right tone, shall we say. So, I mean, looking for music, even if you have budget, is is difficult even on these sort of you know premium websites there's a lot there that that isn't ideal and isn't great so it's about really thinking about the tone and sort of finding the right keywords to sift through the mass of what's out there to find what you need um there are other options like um you know approaching uh you know people individuals uh, to sort of license their music but again it's just important to understand the legalities there so i'd look at um the working with suppliers resource the sort of talk of you know covers the kind of copyright issues but don't feel like you can't do that or can't approach people in that way it's just about having watertight agreements in mind the big no-no basically is commercial music you know what you hear on the radio not just because um you might have legal issues but also because youtube and those platforms now have filters where they can detect licensed music and just won't let it upload so even if you sort of got away with it in terms of, you know, Beyonce not noticing you've used her music, YouTube will notice for her. So those are the reasons. But yeah, to answer that question, I'd look at the free music archive um, and I'd look at included music in these apps, start from there and then sort of notch up the scale from there. But Audio Jungle, if you, you're willing to do the hard work of sifting through, has got a lot that is usable for very little, sort of five, 10 pounds a track. So that's a kind of, compromise but yeah it's not easy it's not easy finding good music yeah but I hope that helps <laughs> it does help and I think we now all enjoy the image of Beyonce sitting at home <laughs> just scanning YouTube for yeah, exactly. organizations videos using her music well yeah I'm sure she's locked down too so you know yeah exactly <laughs> 
Right, next question from Emma King. She says, hi, Nick, thank you, this is all brilliant. Would you be able to say something about appropriate budgets for commissioning different types of video content? I often talk to museums who are keen to get professional input into film projects, but don't know what kind of financial outlay this involves. Um, it's difficult, and I don't want to be sort of cagey about it, because I, but, but it's difficult to say. What I would say is it's less about how long a video is, um, and it's more about actually what's involved in terms of scope. So in terms of your expectations as an organization, I'll be thinking, what are we actually asking of this supplier in terms of time? If you're thinking, hold on, what we want them to do is come for one day, we can definitely have these three people ready to interview on the same day. And we just want then a few shots of these objects or this place. That ask is essentially less than um, a sort of, you know, protracted project where there's multiple trips to multiple places for multiple interviews and shots. So I think it's about thinking for yourself about what the actual scope is there. And then it's also, it's, it, it's a really difficult one because every project is diff different. Would you um, say that uh, sometimes in the, in, in the heritage sector, we're, we've sort of put the budget together before, or we've got the budget approved before we've maybe been able to speak to the supplier. So maybe it's about speaking to a couple of suppliers, first of all, to say like, what would this take? before yeah, yeah. that budget is finalised rather than trying to do it the other way around? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I, and I also think that people will have, you, I think, you know, obviously when it comes to actually getting tenders in or getting kind of, you know, proposals in, you may want those suppliers to be offering, you know, suggested budget rather than telling them how much you've got, because then obviously the thought is, well, they'll just take all of it if they tell us how much it is. But I think often, you know, myself included, quite open to those speculative conversations and exploring options. What I tend to do is offer kind of bracketed quotes and you say, well, you could have this for this. And here are the benefits of spending more but it's not necessarily about quality it again normally comes down to scope so it's sort of here's what's achievable with this budget because it's essentially less of a commitment in terms of time and resources and here's what you can get by broadening that scope in terms of complexity perhaps it's animation perhaps it's bespoke music perhaps it's bespoke techniques in terms of filming but i'd say there's a conversation to be had speculatively there also talk to other peer organizations many will have experience of working with suppliers and will be able to give you an idea of what they got. So if you are thinking of creating a bit of content because you've seen something similar, then make, you know, reach out to maybe that organization and ask, get, get an idea of what it costs for them to produce it. The only reason I sort of would hesitate to put figures on things is I feel like every project is so different that it's difficult to kind of say it's this much, but you can do something meaningful with relatively little if you think creatively about the approach to actually doing that. Um, there's not a kind of like baseline minimum that you know content producers won't get out of bed for. It's about coming up with a creative solution to the brief and the resources available, I would say. I hope that helps and isn't too much of a sort of avoiding the question. Yeah. Okay, the next question is from Naomi Lewis and it's, can you say something about creating videos with children as the main audience, please? For example, school-based learning. Yeah, well, I think um, any organization looking to do that is possibly likely to already be engaging with children in uh, some way already, perhaps there's, there's sort of other forms of, um, you know, engagement with young people you're doing. My, my experience, the best way to work with children is involve them in the process, um, either in terms of generating the ideas, uh, in the form of a kind of sort of curated workshop of some kind um, uh, or potentially even featuring, although, you know, that comes with its challenges and also, of course, comes with uh, legal issues in terms of permission and parental consent. Those, again, are surmountable. But I would say the best way to approach it um, is to yeah work with young people and get a sense of what resonates with them. Because there's one thing to take complex ideas, exhibitions, content, and sort of simplify them in a sense for a particular age of young people. But it's quite another to hit the kind of keynotes in terms of what really connects. So I think it's making things relevant. Um, I think it's drawing um, parallels with their lives now um, and making connections and making it real for them. But yeah, wherever possible, I would look to uh, involve either throughout or at least in some form of workshop input from young people themselves um, to get the best out of that kind of project. On the uh, on the safety front, and don't quote me on the exact title, but I believe the National Lottery Heritage Fund have produced a guide on working with young people safely online um, that's on their website. Great, great, yeah. 
Right, next question. And this is a question I had actually also written down because I would love to know the answer okay. from Astrid Crummins. And it's any tips for recording audio outdoors to minimise wind noise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no, definitely. OK, so number one is do you really have to film it on that day if it's really windy? But that honestly, that's like that is number one. I have I have postponed shoots specifically because it's too windy. And e even with what I'm going to say, you know, following in mind, you can't always completely eradicate it. Um, but if you have to film on that day, it's just essential for whatever reason, then think about where you can go that's most sheltered, you know, uh, and try to get round, you know, perhaps it's the other side of the building, perhaps it's under the cover of those trees over there and essentially get out of the wind. So you may have to compromise a bit on your shot, but sound is often paramount, particularly if you're going to overlay your content with other images, where you film the interview, for example, might not always be as important as getting good sound. Uh, but again, if you must be in a certain place and it's very windy, then those lapel mics are a great place to start because they can be essentially put kind of underneath a shirt or jumper and kept or at least tucked into the kind of collar of a jacket and sheltered. The issue there, though, is potentially getting scraping noise of clothing on them. So you have to try to excuse me, give them sort of space uh, and maybe even do a little test recording to check that it sounds clean. Um, and then you, you'll often see um, you can get these little fluffy covers for lapel mics. They may not come with one. It might come with a little sponge cover that's that big that won't do much to protect noise. But you can get these kind of wind shields or wind jammers um that you can put over the top i mean some of them are huge they're sort of this big for a tiny lapel mic but that will basically knock it out pretty much completely so if you're filming someone walking around a landscape talking about you know sort of uh and needing to be on a hilltop to do that then getting one of those uh things tucking it into the top of your jacket testing it that will give you your best chance is there anything is there a kind of simple uh savior option for if you do have to film on that day or the the footage you have from outside is it's a blue tit landing on a a branch and you will never get it again but the audio is all windy um what would what would you do in that scenario could these simple editors you've recommended sort of mute out that uh video right like so removing background noise yeah, yeah I've, I, well actually i do think that um I need to double check this, but I believe that iMovie has recently added a feature where it uh, technically claims to be able to deal with background noise. Um, but that, but background noise filters tend to focus on kind of hiss or hum, kind of constant background noise, like maybe kind of traffic in the distance, um, that kind of thing. Uh, potentially sort of wind noise, but honestly, it's not that easy to kind of fix it in post. But if it's your visual shots, ah, this is actually, this is important. So if you're filming some visual sequences to accompany perhaps a voiceover or interview, but those visual shots, again, you know, um, like the unmissable visual moment has got all kinds of wind noise on, on, on it. Well, then you can actually individually select all those clips and essentially turn the volume off or down and use the accompanying voiceover or interview or indeed perhaps music to kind of fill that void in terms of sound. So that's less easy to do if you're making a film about the you know the song of a particular bird fine but like if if the if the if it's a bonus but not essential to have the sound from those visual clips you can turn all that off and use other sound um yeah great i will i will change our topic now to uh, a question from kevin taylor who says excellent examples what about access issues now there was a bit in the chat um this this question came early on there were various things recommended mm -hmm. for example the the museum disability collaborative network have um, some great resources on accessibility and audio description and captioning is there anything from from your perspective that you you'd like to sort of add in about accessibility and access. I think I do actually have and I don't have them to hand I do have a bunch of links I could send over on that so I can add them into the slides I think that um, in terms of things like um, uh, adding sign language in that's normally a kind of specialist thing and something that there are a lot of really good agencies who can do that um, and that's something worth considering. It's, it tend, tends to be professional and you send your finished video and get something where essentially there's a picture cropped in with somebody delivering the sign language on the side. Um, in terms of captioning, that's one limitation of something like using YouTube's captions because you won't have control over necessarily exactly how they appear, how big they are, 
And if you know your video is going to be very small, for example, uh, perhaps featured on Instagram and people are going to be looking at it on their phones, you may want to decide through testing what scale you want those captions to be. So then actually using the inbuilt tools in something like Premiere Rush or iMovie or DaVinci Resolve, it's about scaling in those captions and adding them yourself. So and also what you can do is also have multiple versions. So you can have your clean version of your film that is uncaptioned, and then you can make another version that's perhaps got bigger subtitles for accessibility on a kind of smaller screen, smaller platform, uh, and have multiple versions as well. So that's some other thoughts, but I do have some other links I can send over on that, some tools I've used in the past. I'll dig those out. That'd be great, thank you. Um, now, there are a couple of questions I can see around uh, equipment um, and kit. So the first one from Colin White is, when should you film in portrait and when in landscape? And mm. can you do a tracking shot without investing in a dolly or track? Uh, yes, you can. So first portrait in landscape. So the main, the main, the sort of easy answer is generally film in landscape all the time, unless you've got a specific reason to film in portrait. That will be my kind of advice, because in terms of the footage you're capturing, either in the, that video itself or as an asset you might look to use elsewhere, that is still the kind of established format for films for video content. But as I sort of touched on earlier, that is changing a bit. So certain platforms are lending themselves more specifically to portrait format. So Instagram stories is one. So I've been on kind of professional shoots with, you know, lots of gear where actually it's going to be repurposed and used in certain parts for Instagram stories. We've been careful to film certain clips in portrait. Um, it might also be that um, just given the setup that you have. So actually, if you think back to that example from the Ditchley Museum with um, the, the object um, and uh, it was Claire from the uh, museum uh, delivering it, you wouldn't have been able to see as much of the object and her if it had been in this format. And as that was a very direct, authentic, straightforward piece of video for the Instagram audience, why not use you know, the format that works better for the actual scenario you're in? So future-proofing, creating a sort of nicer asset in mind that you want to repurpose in multiple ways, stick to this, but specific platforms or, 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 or reasons to use portrait exist. Yeah, default is landscape. And then as for tracking shots, um, you know, there are, it depends what you mean by tracking shot. If you mean like a walkthrough, that's when I wouldn't worry so much about like, tr like a track in terms of a, a track on the floor with a tripod and something much bigger. I wouldn't necessarily consider if you're using a phone or a hybrid camera, you can get relatively affordable sort of sliders and dollies, which might be an option, but you can also just do a lot by just holding things in the right way. So if you sort of, you know, again, use this sort of elbow technique and just kind of move out from behind a wall to create a kind of dolly sort of a movement. If you do it carefully, you can still get sort of 80% of the way there um, without any investment in equipment. So it's partly just about technique and practicing and working within the limitations. What I wouldn't recommend is kind of walking down corridors and upstairs, just holding your phone like this, because that's where that movement will be too much. And that's where a kind of cheaper gimbal, and there are genuinely affordable ones now that will hold a smartphone, very little ones. That's where you might want to consider that for big trekking shots. I hope that helps. Yes, let's let's certainly not recommend walking up or downstairs staring at your phone <laughs> oh, yes. whilst filming. Please yeah. don't do that. Um, okay, so uh, because we're using upvoting, the questions are sort of jumping around. So there's a, there's a, there's a new top question um, that I will go into. It's by Alison Finiston, and it's can footage from smartphones and video cameras be combined into one film? Uh, sorry, so footage from smartphones and other cameras together. Yeah, so sort of a mix. There, there was an example. I think you showed it at the beginning. There was a, there was a, the moving of a statue, and it maybe looked like it started with a sort of video camera, very pro shot, and then cut into something that could have been mobile footage that seemed sort of less formal. So I think it's, I think it's, can you use both in one in one film? Yes, but I think it also depends on what that film is. So if it's a 20 second, I mean, yes, is a simple answer. So technically very easily, um, because if you're filming um, 
yeah, one thing I actually meant to mention is about sort of formats and resolutions. A lot of phones will default to 4K, which is super high resolution. But if you're trying to make something for social media, that's way more than you need to deal with in terms of the size of uh, the files, the resolution. So if you're filming in sort of 1080p, which is normal HD, I'm going to add a note into the slides about this then that's also the kind of standard format of a professional camera. So resolution wise, technically in terms of an editing application, handling different formats, no problem at all. In terms of the aesthetic, I think it just depends a little bit. I mean, if it, everything except for one shot that's nowhere near as nice uh, is sort of, you know, is gonna stand out. And what you're trying to create is a very slick 30 second overview of your offer as an organization, then maybe the answer is no. But if you're trying to tell a story and that's the priority, and there's a combination perhaps of um, shots that set up the context, set up you as an organization, and then more kind of, you know, uh, spontaneous bits of the story, they, I think if the, if the aesthetic fits well with what you're actually trying to achieve and doesn't kind of jar, then there's no reason not to do it. I mean, there's loads of examples of feature films that were started on proper cameras and finished on smartphones, I say loads, there are some. So Searching for Sugar Man, that documentary that I think was either nominated for or won an Academy Award, they ran out of budget. So they filmed the second half of the film on smartphones using accessories and being careful with how they did it. And you can hardly tell. Um, it's very much like how you do it and making the, making the sort of best of the limitations rather than an obvious difference in quality. I think uh, you can get 90% of the way there with a phone and accessories if you're uh, doing it the right way. Brilliant. Well, we are going to keep going with some questions. So if you if you if you do have to leave, please do go and know that this will be on the recording. But we we still have 30 open questions. I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them, but we'll, we'll try as many as we possibly can. Um, next question from Jane Gibson is I keep seeing these 360 degree selfie stick walks. Are they affordable? Spent ages working out where the selfie stick stick had gone in the final product. Oh right, yes. Well, they they um the they they they're designed so that the kind of bit that you mount it onto essentially doesn't kind of get filmed. Uh, there's no sort of lens there, so there's sort of selfie sticks able to disappear quite easily. I mean, they again the the technology. I can include some links to some affordable examples of 360 cameras. Um, they're, yeah, they're increasingly affordable. It's actually very, very straightforward. The magic happens in terms of the software that brings it together to be actually experienced as 360. And it's a sort of a case by case because some platforms um, essentially, um, so there's one, I have to check what it's actually called, but there's, there's some where essentially you can use an app on your phone to actually within a particular room capture a 360 image, but you have to uh, have a sort of subscription to the service to be able to then share the result of that. So the simple answer is it's it's relatively straightforward, uh, relatively affordable now to capture those things, but it's about the platform you share it on that potentially involves subscription or more of a commitment. Um, I can add some notes in uh, on that more specifically, but it is quite achievable and it's not it's not necessarily a completely specialist thing though. That's making that me helps. think I have I have seen one of those three 360 room tours on the I believe the Paralympic Heritage Trust have one on the front of their website and I cannot mm -hmm. remember what the service is. So I will find out and add yeah. that in too. I'm gonna add a note for that to put something in to the slides. <laughs> Okay, next question. Now, uh, this one has been on for a while, so I will take it from Culture Healing Communities. Um, they want to do segments of recording and filming oral memories from their, their groups, taking into account no knowledge at all, how to start, what equipment do we need, and what software do we need to edit and upload? Uh, please explain for dummies. Um, okay, well, um... One question would be uh, about whether, and this might not be able to be a sort of conversation back and forth, I appreciate, but what the question I would ask is, do you need to film them or do you just want to have the audio recordings? I would say from the sounds of what you're suggesting, especially if you're starting this with very little experience, is you can do everything you need to do on your phone. Um, I think if you don't need the video, if you actually just need the audio and they're uh, from those actual conversations, then just record the audio. So there might this might still be another way to um, add video uh, uh, to, to put it together into a video using still images, perhaps using other filmed clips of those people 
um, you know, doing things as part of their everyday lives or indeed um, uh, other archive shots. But what you may not want to do, or you may consider not doing is filming the interviews and actually editing them as filmed interviews themselves. It might be simpler if you really want to start with a simple approach to record the audio, uh, cut the audio together, um, perhaps using one of those um, apps like Premiere Rush or iMovie, and then adding in other images that can complement those stories um, rather than just having a kind of talking head interview. Um, but I think with that, and there's quite a lot in that question, I would basically, the short answer I think is just use your phone. I don't even think based on what you've said, you need much in terms of accessories. Look back through, I think, at the most kind of straightforward tools um, in the slides. And I think maybe so you don't feel like you're kind of fully committed, have a go, try, try something out with one person or even just internally and see what works and see what you think and, and, and try to come up with a format. Because I think really what would be nice then is it to have a, a consistent approach to all of them. So to try things out, get a kind of convention that works for you. And then when you're happy, sort of roll that out. But it, you, the microphone is actually probably the one thing you might want to invest in. If it's, if it's you know, if it's really, that, it sounds like the main priority, whether you film it or not is another thing, but maybe consider one of these relatively affordable 10, 20 pound lapel microphones to get really clean sound, whether you film them or not. I hope that helps. That sounds really helpful. I have, I have one thing to add to that as, as oral history projects are my background. I would always go and have a look at the Oral History Society's website because they have the, if, if, if what you need is the, the sort of basic getting started on the oral history side and thinking about the archiving and the, the, the file formats and the, and the quality, they have, they have pointers on there too. Um, and someone's just put that in the chat as well. Great, um, great. So uh, another question from Susanna Jones. Do you have any great examples of bilingual videos where both languages are treated with parity? Um, yes, actually, um, but well, yes and no. So I think that um, it, one thing is doing it with text. So I had this challenge with a, a National Pro Trust project in Wales um, where we wanted to give parity to Welsh and English. Um, and actually the format we ended up going for, for a, a, a raft of reasons, but primarily this in the end, was using sort of animated text captions in both languages that came up at the same time, not just at the bottom, the sort of subtitles, but actually integrating those into the video and, and having the Welsh and English come up at the same time. So I think if you want, if you have people speaking in both languages, um, then that's, you know, just a case of obviously being able to kind of get translations and then have them in the relevant subtitles. Um, so either way, you know, you're kind of covered, but I think, I would look potentially at a format like using text um, and a creative way to include the captions in both languages. Um, that may not be the right solution for you. But in terms of other examples, nothing springs to mind, I have to admit, but I can have a look. But that's certainly how I've dealt with that challenge before is, is allowing the format to, to, to be built up from, with that in mind. Yeah, no, that, sound, that sounds like a really helpful example. Um, okay, we're still we're still going up on the questions. Um, I'll take this one from Matt Lund. Uh, what is the optimal length of video for social media? Mm. Thinking about behind the scenes collections focus. Yeah, well, you know, it's I'm always surprised by what like what you find and what actually works. So some of those examples, um, the more sort of immediate, authentic um, uh, things I, I showed you earlier on. Um, some of those are actually quite long. So some of the craft examples, um, is, I think one of them is 15 minutes long. But again, that, that sort of works because it's, uh, and I, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not necessarily suggesting that that's an ideal length, far from it. But actually, it, it really comes down, I think, to what the platform is. Um, and like less is definitely more. So if you've got a way to kind of really focus on your primary message, your key content, and keep it as short as possible, that's great. I mean, I wouldn't, what I wouldn't do is say, let's make a five minute video or let's make a 10 minute video. I would look at all those key considerations in the pre-production sort of slide and think about where it's going to go, who it's for, um, what other examples perhaps are out there and what length, you know, what kind of conventions do they follow? Are they getting watched? You know, are they popular? And maybe dial it in from there. Um, it's, you know, there's no need to kind of stretch something out, but then equally, if it has to be five minutes to cover what you want to cover, that's also fine. Here's another thought as well, is that maybe you can have different versions. So one thing I often offer um, 
is a kind of modular approach to the structure of something. So um, an example is a project I did for Royal Parks about Brompton Cemetery. It's a huge range of themes and a huge range of content, but rather than having a kind of beginning the early, early 19th century and then gradually getting towards today, we took a thematic approach. It was broken down into different aspects of the story. And although the film in the end um, was about eight minutes long, each section was under a minute. And that was also delivered as a modular collection of smaller pieces of content that could then be rolled out over social media platforms in a shorter form. So you've then got a much more flexible approach. So you can get away with longer, I think, if you think cleverly about your structure and if you think about how it could be compartmentalized and delivered in different formats. So you're, you've got a more flexible approach. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. That's a that's an excellent idea. I may have to uh, may have to steal that one. Um, <laughs> now I'm gonna I'm gonna take one that's on a slightly different topic, but I think particularly relevant to now um, from Sally Dodson. And it's hi, I have an online lecture that was recorded on Zoom. It, what's the best platform for me to edit it a little, adding a title page and credits at the end, and maybe an odd image on the talk? I presume sort of cutting over the the person's. Mm -hmm. Well, I think once you've got a kind of longer piece of content like that, you do have to look to one of the proper editing platforms to deal with a clip of that length. So those sort of more simple template based approaches that you might get from something like it was, you know, Lumen5 and Mosho and those kind of things, they're really driven towards quick clips, quick captions and a sort of short format. If you've got a longer piece of content, you can't really avoid one of those proper editing systems. So at the simpler end, Premier Rush and iMovie, and perhaps DaVinci Resolve, again, you know, if, um, for, if you need something more complex. But for what you're suggesting, iMovie or Premier Rush would deal with it very well um, and would allow you to go in and kind of cut it down, um, cut the clip down, remove the bits that you don't want. You can also, on both of those, sort of crop the clip. So let's say you've got, you know, the kind of interface of Zoom around the edge and you want to clean it up. You can also crop in and clean it up. So you've got a cleaner piece of video content. Um, you can add captions beginning and end. You can add captions over the top. You can even add subtitles during the video if you want to do that as well. So I think the, yeah, the short answer is use one of the proper editing platforms. There's no real way of avoiding of avoiding that. But you, that, that, comes, uh, yeah, that comes with the benefits of being able to create something much cleaner at the end. OK, a good one that links to that, because the if you've got an online recording of like, for example, this recording of sort of nearly two hours of, mm -hmm. of webinar, it's going to be a huge file. Um, so Stephen S says, are there any apps or do you have any advice on compressing large video files for use on social media? Et cetera? Yes, yes, yes. So um, there are a couple of I'm going to have to uh, dig out my links to these because I um, I use one that comes with the Adobe suite so any of the adobe programs you license uh, to will give you access to their compressor which is amazing but there are a couple of really good free compression tools um which i will dig out and put in the slides the, like what i would urge you not to do is just google it and, and go with the, the quickest one you find because there are loads of just not very well functioning examples out there that will claim to be free and actually what they'll do is not give you enough flexibility or put watermarks on it or actually you download it and you have to pay for it so avoid just doing that i will send over a couple of specific um uh, solutions for that but they do exist you can get fully functioning free compressing tools um but the other option is um that um you know I would still, when you're editing, work with your original material as much as possible. Don't really compress at that stage. If what you mean is compressing for uh, delivery, uh, when you actually want to upload it, um, then these are the right tools. But I would urge you, if you can, to work with your original material when you're actually editing to kind of retain the quality through that process. Brilliant. Thank you. Are you okay to do another five minutes? Next? I'm absolutely fine, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm not going anywhere, yeah. We'll go to we'll go to quarter two for those who can stay with us. Um, so one from Antonia Malcolm. Will there be? Oh, that's 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 more for me about the participants from today. Um, so I'll I'll answer that in the in the chat. But we'll move to Gabriel Gale. Quite a specific question on editing. Can you use iMovie on desktop if you have footage on an Android phone? Uh, yes, you can, but you, I mean, iMovie itself only works on 
Apple. So if you've got an Apple desktop, but you put your footage on an Android phone, then there's no problem at all. You just need to get your clips onto that desktop, you know, just connect it with a USB um, cable, or if you've got a phone that can remove the SD card, uh, then take the SD card out and you know get a get a cheap adapter to be able to put that in. Once those clips are on your computer, um, iMovie should be able to deal with most formats. That's one of those benefits of Premiere Rush and iMovie is that a lot of the complexities around different formats, and there are a lot of them, they are able to deal with very powerfully under the bonnet. So you don't have to worry about mixing different kinds of footage or setting up your sequence with the right settings for different kinds of formats. They're really, really powerful at dealing with that. So without knowing the exact specifics of your phone and its settings, I would say I would be fairly confident in saying there'd be no problem. You just need to get it onto your Apple desktop uh, and then drop it, drop all the clips in. Brilliant. Um, so another question that I think is particularly pertinent to the time we are in right now uh, from Susan Taylor, what do you recommend when we are working from home without such kit, even a smartphone? Um, and I presume this is sort of how can we make a video, a piece of video content without a smartphone or, mm. or a camera? Um, and I think my thought to that is that we, if you, if you have a laptop with a, with a webcam embedded, then you can create a, a video using something like just Zoom. You can record yourself on there. Uh, but what 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 does the professional person no no i think it's a really good question so there's sort of there's two things so if you need if you want to still be able to capture new spoken content then you've got the option of these form of kind of virtual you know interviews and i've done a few of these and you know the benefit is you have you know as long as you're kind of uh, go about it in the right way you have got the ability to get you know really good results you can discuss with the person beforehand about where they're going to film in terms of the light in terms of being quiet in terms of what they've got behind them in the setup and kind of make sure that works. You can do a test to make sure it sounds fine. You can then take the recording of that uh, Zoom conversation, making sure you had it on, you know, full screen sort of seminar mode. Uh, you can then take that clip into an editing uh, app like iMovie or Premiere Rush, crop out the sides and you've got your interview. But if you don't even want to do that, if you want to just take, uh, if you just want to create video content maybe out of an existing bank of still images that you have and tell a story that way, then that's where I think those uh, apps like Lumen5 and Mosho come into their own because, and also um, uh, Adobe Spark, because that way you're able to drop in assets that you do have, and by asset I mean image or video clip, and, and then essentially type in, you know, the captions that you want, restructure and create your story that way. And you can create really successful content that way, essentially entirely out of still images that you already have or that people send you. Um, and it requires then just a bit more of a scripted approach in terms of thinking about your structure and you know, writing out your captions and keeping those as short and pithy as possible. But I think that, that's, that those are some thoughts I would have and that can be a really successful approach. Um, video content isn't always about getting a camera out. It's about bringing stories to life in that kind of linear storytelling format. So there's plenty you can do without a camera um, or a smartphone, or indeed from without leaving the house. A couple of people in the chat are mentioning uh, PowerPoint, using PowerPoint to make video content. Um, as a yes, you can. You can like screen capture, and you can sort of you know go through things that way. Um, yes, the, like uh, you can, and you can also um, yeah like export from. In fact, that's yeah I've done that a couple of times for. Um, Yes, remember leaving an organization with a kind of editable welcome video they had on a screen behind their sort of welcome desk. And there was a video that file that goes into the TV, like a USB stick, but they had the PowerPoint presentation, which they could change the text content for new events um, and then just export that as a, as a video file. Um, I've got a funny feeling you can't do it on, or you couldn't do it on Macs, you could only do it on PCs, but I'd have to check. But yeah, you can export, you can definitely export video files from PowerPoint. Um, and that can be quite flexible, actually. Um, certainly for something like a welcome screen where you want to update it. So that's a really good tip. Yeah, it's a good thought from, I forgot about that. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to declare this the last question now um, and, and, and apologize to everybody that we, we haven't been able to get to, um, but I'm sure we could all sit here for hours um, talking to Nick and getting the benefit of his experience. So 
It's from Joanna Murray and it's what is the recommended clip length before changing the subject? For example, if a video clip is showing a sunrise, how many seconds should you stay on the sunrise before switching to a different scene, such as a close up of a leaf? Mm, OK, well, again, as you can imagine, I'm not going to give you a sort of completely straightforward answer, but it's about and this is really about uh, watching content and getting an idea of the feel and tone that you want in that bit of content. So if it's a really snappy, really energetic, come to this amazing event, uh, you know, kind of dynamic video, then you'll probably find when you put it together or you watch examples of that, that clips are a second long, two seconds long, really short. And that's the rhythm and the convention and pace of that video. But you might actually find, let's say it's a piece of content where you've got, I don't know, a poem being read. Um, and I, I say that because I'm working with the, the Wordsworth Trust and we're creating like a 50 minute film of poetry readings, some well known, some unknown readers. And in the end, we decided rather than trying to have an image for every line to sort of corroborate what was being said, we just sort of create an environment for each poem. So there's one shot or two shots for each poem. So sometimes 30 seconds, 45 seconds, even a minute for some of them, because they just give you that peace and that slow pace to sit and listen and concentrate on the words. So the main point is being consistent. So if you had one shot that's sort of incredibly long and then you know the rest of it's very choppy, that might not be the right way to do it. It's about creating a feel and a rhythm um, and often your music will help with that. The kind of content, whether it's captions or interviews will help with that. And then finding a consistent way to get across that tone and that feel with how long your clips are. But yeah, anything from a second to a minute can work depending on what it is. Brilliant. Well, with that, Nick, I think we will we will close the Q&A session um, and let you just take a breath, <laughs> have some water. Um, yeah, but thank you so much. I think I speak for all of our sort of there is hundreds of participants today uh, in the session when I say thank you so much for all of your all of your knowledge that you shared. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks for, you know, for sticking with it. And I think, yeah, I know I sort of rattled through a lot because we had relatively limited time and a huge amount to cover. But I hope um, certainly with having the slides on hand to refer back to that there's sort of some something there to, to get you guys started. The main thing is just having a go like any sort of form of creative content. It's just getting started and you'll very quickly learn what works for you, what you can do within the tools that you have and look at what's being done. You know, it's stealing ideas, put it that way, or just getting inspiration is what all of us are doing all the time. Um, and just kind of like finding the right tone and fit for your organization. And the last thing I would say is don't shy away from humor, from being true to the characters that you're working with, you know, get, be, keep that authenticity and keep that kind of tone um, to your work and that will come across and that will result in engagement because people will, will, will believe it. It feels like the, the 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 key word for your, your session today has been confidence. Yeah. And just feeling confident to try and 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 yeah, experiment. Um, yeah, absolutely. So on that note, if you do take forward any of the tips from today, please let us know. We'd love to know if you um, if you if you go away and do something different, or you make a piece of film content, um, share it with us, and then we can share it with other people, and they can be inspired by your work. Please do fill in the feedback form that will pop up as you leave the session. It's it's really, really helpful for our evaluation and for, for what we're planning. I have a funny feeling we'll be asking it back for something else in the, in the future. Um, please join us at another Heritage Digital session. We have, we have a virtual day coming up. We have workshops. We have webinars. We have digital guides that are coming up. Um, it's heritagedigital.org and uh, see you at another Heritage Digital event, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.